Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? I hope I'm clearly audible. So uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to you all to the Mediate Guru First National Webinar for Nepal. Talking about Mediate Guru, it is a social initiative led by members across the globe. The aim of the organization is to bridge the gap between the general public and litigation. We are creating a social awareness campaign for showcasing the mediation as the future. Having successfully conducted various uh, international webinars promoting alternative dispute resolution, having a reach in more than 100 countries around the world with an international family growing each day, we try you to provide the best lecture series around through the best speakers around the globe so that you have a value addition today. I, Ruby Shrestha, currently studying in National Law College in fifth semester, feel honored today to welcome you all and our esteemed speaker for the very first session of the national webinar, Mr. Akshay Aryal. Mr. Aryal is an associate at Pioneer Law Associate. He is a part of the corporate team of the firm and is involved in various corporate matters, including due diligence, corporate compliance, research and drafting in areas related to private equity, foreign direct investment, taxation and energy laws. He has completed his BLLB from Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad, and has been involved in the field of alternative dispute resolution from 2015. He had also interned with the dispute resolution team at D. Berti Jatia Francini for Lani Legal, Rome, Italy in November 2017. Observing several international mediations, including court mandated mediations and international commercial arbitration. He has represented his university in various arbitration, mediation, and negotiation competitions in both national and international levels. He and his team was awarded with the best negotiation strategy at the third IBA VIAC Consensual Dispute Resolution Competition, CDRC. Vienna International Negotiation and Mediation Competition held at University of Vienna. Mr. Ariel has also start, shared his enthusiasm for ADR through teaching, training, extensive writing, and public speaking. He believes that ADR holds a key value in the future of dispute resolution in Nepal and elsewhere. Today, he will be talking about introduction to alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So, if you have any questions or doubts, you can all send the mess. Uh, you can all send the questions in the chat box so that later in the session we can have a discussion on the same. Now, I would like to request Mr. Akshay Aryal to take the session forward and enlighten all of us. The floor is all yours, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to many people. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. And thank you, uh, Mediate Guru, for organizing this event. In today's era of uh, dispute resolution, I think in our part of the world, alternative forms of dispute resolution are still uh, slightly behind as compared to your conventional courtroom uh, methods of dispute resolution. So today, I would just like to go over my take on alternative dispute resolutions and try to uh, help the participants who I'm expecting most are law students, aspiring bright lawyers of the future, to take cognizance of the various, uh, uh, if various forms of dispute resolution that are available to us and just sort of uh, understand the process and see how it really works. So uh, if I'm audible to everyone, I would like to start with my presentation right away. OK, here we go. So uh, this is an introduction to alternative dispute resolution. And uh, I would like to discuss the following things with you. Right. So what is alternative dispute resolution? 
and this is something we the the term alternative dispute resolution is something that most of us are already familiar with but what exactly does it entail is something that i intend to cover with this next segment uh, so alternative dispute resolution the general characteristics are that this is a procedure wherein two or more parties can resolve the disputes without having to resort to your traditional courtroom litigation and as the name suggests it is an alternative to uh, your conventional forms of dispute resolution they are more time effective and uh, cost efficient that is that uh, you know the time is time taken by courts we know that the courts work with a lot of backlog on the plates and this is a method which would not only uh, ease the burdens of the court while uh, resolving disputes at an, at an expedited rate but at the same time it would also help the parties to get a speedy remedy uh, for their disputes and another important fact factor of uh, adr is that it is usually very flexible in terms of the procedure and the methodology and one need not uh, you know burden themselves with a lot of procedural laws and procedural rules that is usually prevalent in your conventional forms of dispute resolution and the most important thing that i would like to highlight with regards to adr is that it is not necessarily a matter of who is right and many a times we have seen parties emerge out with a conclusion wherein the highlight is on what is right for them moving forward so uh, these are the general characteristics uh, so then coming down to your common forms of adr uh, the most common form of adr that uh, we see ha having taking place in almost all jurisdictions right now is arbitration and uh, arbitration is sort of like an ad hoc litigation wherein the parties uh, appoint one or more arbitrators to preside over the proceedings of the case and the parties flexibly present their cases their findings their evidences before the arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators and the arbitrators present an award which uh, which contains all the decisions based on the facts and the law related to the case and another form of media another form is mediation uh, it is a very flexible process where parties sit with a neutral third party and uh, there are different kinds of mediation that is something we will cover later and uh, then we have conciliation conciliation is again similar to a, a mediation process but in this case the conciliator is not exactly a mediator and the conciliator's job is to uh, sensitize the parties with regards to all the options that they have available to them while resolving the disputes and um, then there is negotiation which is again that happens directly between parties and it happens all the time and then we also have a collaborative law where both parties uh, decide to appoint one attorney or lawyer and then this lawyer uh, demarcates the exact rights and remedies of both parties and helps the parties reach a settlement in the end uh, collaborative law is more of a domestic uh, form of uh, dispute resolution and you can say is sort of like a mediation or a conciliation so there are no uh, strict separations between uh, adr it, the the adr mechanisms these are all very fluid process okay so um, dispute is can, can someone please uh, help with the video thing okay I just want the participants to be able to see this clearly thank you so let's analyze very uh, primarily what are the what are the basic differences so as you can see here i have um, uh, tabled judicial process arbitration and mediation in the three columns and in rows there are different factors and the product of each factor is provided in this table so if we look at speed as i already mentioned before judicial is a slow process you know the courts function um, in in a certain way where the many steps cannot be skipped or compromised and uh, in in uh, disputes related to say even family matters the process is unnecessarily drawn out and uh, with arbitration it is a relatively faster time bound process and mediation you see it's a speedy resolution 
okay and then when we see the costs involved litigation is a very pricey form of dispute resolution contrary to popular belief where people feel that arbitration is more costly but that is not the case and um, arbitration in fact has reduced costs and mediation is uh, relatively inexpensive because the only cost that you need to bear is the cost of the mediator which can again be shared by the parties and uh, and when we go to the decision making authority in the court you know that the judge presides over the court and the judge is supreme and whatever the judge presents in their judgment is the law of the land uh, in arbitration there is no hard and fast uh, authority of giving decisions merely because there is an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrator present because uh, you know in many cases in arbitration when part if there are say five issues the parties can choose to consensually resolve three issues between them and can ask the arbitrator to uh, pronounce the judgment on just two matters and uh, in mediation parties can appoint the mediator of their choice and mediator has no decision uh, decision making power and even if any decision is made by the mediator it is absolutely non binding upon the parties uh, the procedure uh, for the for judicial process is of course it's as determined by the law we have many many acts that uh, govern the, uh, the intricacies of judicial decision making process and for arbitration parties have the flexibility to choose what law would govern them and what law would govern the disputes in fact uh, we can also have a complex kind of uh, governing law where s s uh, a certain law of some jurisdiction would govern a certain part of the transaction and the other part of the transaction could be governed by uh, the law of some other jurisdiction and uh, in mediation in many cases we have seen that the law is just kept aside and parties directly jump into the merits of the case and so this, the same would apply for evidences and uh, forum forum selection is also beyond the control of the parties uh, in the in the sense that if there is a tax dispute then the parties must go to the revenue tribunals and uh, in arbitration uh, there is i mean the parties choose the arbitral board and the venue of the arbitration and even the seat of the arbitration which is the law that would govern the arbitration and uh, there is no specific forum for uh, mediation dispute resolution and then uh, when we talk about privacy you know that judicial process are a, judicial process is a public proceedings and even the judgments would be published in a public domain whereas in arbitration the, the said judgments can be uh, reserved as a private uh, document and mediation the mediator is bound by strict confidentiality and the parties can also enter into a non disclosure uh, settlement between themselves and appeal with regards to appeal the decision uh, of a judicial process you know that the parties have a right to appeal whereas for arbitration there are very limited grounds for appeal which we will be covering in course of this session and uh, mediation uh, the settlement if both parties are uh, settling uh, they arrive at a conclusion wherein they sign a settlement agreement then that settlement agreement after being executed would be binding upon the parties okay so um, let's discuss arbitration which is uh, most people's favorite form of dispute resolution so we know how arbitration works it is it is a, a quasi adjudicatory process where there are adversarial uh, proceedings which means that there are two parties against they are pinned against each other and there's a neutral third party arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators that make the decision and the proceedings are sort of similar to litigation but they are you know faster and cheaper and more flexible in terms of uh, procedural uh, obligations and rules of evidence and at the same time the parties have the independence to chalk out the same in the agreement to arbitration you know that before the arbitration there has to be an arbitration agreement between the parties to the arbitration and this would sort of uh, lay down all the procedure regarding the said arbitration and arbitral decisions are final and binding on the parties and there are very limited scope of appeal in this regards now specific to to the nepalese uh, legal regime there is an arbitration act which was enacted in 1999 the arbitration rules which was enacted in 2003 
and then there is uh, the, the arbitration act is the ratified version of the new york convention which was uh, signed on 1958 right so as i pointed out appeal uh, in arbitration is very restricted and uh, this slide specifically caters to the grounds for appeal in nepalese context and but uh, for all the friends who have joined us from various jurisdictions please feel free to add on in the chat box, uh, the specific uh, conditions of appeal in your jurisdiction. So uh, in Nepal, as per the Arbitration Act, an appeal can be made within 35 days of the passing of the award. If either party is not competent to conclude the arbitration agreement, the arbitration agreement is of course signed before the proceedings of the arbitration. Or if the arbitration agreement is invalid as per the governing law, Please note that the governing law need not be the laws of Nepal. It, it depends on the seat of the arbitration and is again determined by the party in the arbitration agreement or uh, even before that in the uh, general contract that led to the dispute. However, in cases where uh, the arbitration uh, agreement is invalid under Nepalese law and there is no clear governing law, then again an appeal can be filed in the respective high court. Uh, appeal can also be filed if the applicant has not received a notice to appoint its arbitrator or notice is not provided. This is a procedural uh, procedural ground for making appeal. And the arbitration decides on issues not submitted to it. So this is the main difference in between arbitration and court, where, wherein, like, uh, say, if we go to the court with five, five issues, and the court can make that five issues into six, seven issues, depending on the need of the land, need of the law, and sometimes need of the precedence. Whereas the arbitral or the arbitral uh, panel and arbitrators do not enjoy the same power as the judges. And um, arbitration and can also the parties can also file for an appeal if the arbitration gives an award that is outside the scope of the arbitration agreement. And or if the arbitration violates the conditions of the arbitration agreement, right? And another thing is uh, that if the arbitrator's appointment or the arbitration proceedings are not completed pursuant to uh, either the agreement of the arbitration or the arbitration act, then again, an appeal can be filed. In case of clash between arbitration agreement and the arbitration act, the arbitration act would reign supreme. Uh, in in uh, cases of conflict, because this is a law passed by the parliament, whereas arbitral agreements are just agreements between two independent parties. Let's move on. Yeah. So after making the appeal, the high courts can either quash the award or order the tribunal to deliberate deliberate again. Um, the courts will quash the award also if the decision is non-arbitrable. Not all matters are arbitrable uh, under Nebley's law and. Uh, or even if it is against public good or policy. So now see, this becomes slightly problematic when you think about it from a practical lawyer point of view, that now the court is enjoying uh, the power, the court enjoys the power to quash an arbitral award on the grounds of public good or public policy. And these are not something that are hardcore uh, defined anywhere. These are things, public good and public policy, and I'm sure many law students here would be able to understand that these are things that you need to interpret from the spirit of the constitution of the land. So uh, this way, uh, this is one of the big problems that arbitration faces vis-a-vis -vis the approach of the courts, because at the end of the day, the court citing grounds of public, public policy and public good can always quash an arbitration award and then take the matter forcibly into courtroom litigation, which sort of nullifies the whole point of an alternative dispute resolution mechanism in the first place. So uh, many, there are many schools of thought in this matter. Conventional courtroom lawyers would always argue that the court is supreme, whereas uh, some uh, arbitration experts argue that uh, this, the court is, uh, the, the, I mean, um, quashing an award on the ground of public good or policy in many cases have has been viewed as ultra wise by them, so this is an ongoing, uh, you know, heated uh, topic of debate. And please, please feel free to do more research on it if you will. And apart from this, there are no other appeal. Uh, there are no other cases of appeal available in an arbitration award. But again, if there is a ground of constitutional right violation, then a writ petition can be filed. But then again, a writ petition can be filed about just against most things in life if there is a constitutional right violation.
okay so this is uh, the part of my presentation that i would like to largely highlight on which is consensual dispute resolution so what it entails is where the parties are the center of the disputes and the parties are also the center of the decision making process okay and until i mean if you if you go back into time all over time people uh, even if you look into history people have always gone to courts or in the absence of courts a higher authority to take decisions that were binding on the parties but slowly this this has changed and now parties want to feel uh, more involved in the decision making process and before we get into the nitty gritties of this i would like to share a story so in my college in my university days when i first started uh, you know understanding mediation and consensual based dispute resolution models this story was the first thing that introduced me to it and um, i'm pretty sure that this story is still a folklore in my alma mater so the story goes like this there are two neighbors and they have their own little backyards which border with each other and right at the fence of their border there is a tree there is an orange tree which sort of has uh, the root in one part of in one person's property but the fruits of the tree are born in another person's property okay so if you understand it the tree is like sort of slanted if you will and this and then spring comes and this tree is an orange tree and it starts producing a lot of oranges and many oranges fall on the ground of the person uh, on whose over whose property the tree uh, tree is situated and this person picks all the oranges so in this regard there is a dispute between the two neighbors on whose or who who has claim over the oranges and who who enjoys the rights to the oranges the orange is property of which particular person and then this dispute becomes really heated and two parties are you know just both laying claim to the oranges uh, aggressively so they decide that okay we cannot resolve this dispute ourselves let's go to court and when they go to court they make their arguments and after making their arguments the court tells them that uh, okay the decision will be taken by the court next week but until then until then if you have if you are able to then you return to us with uh, with a decision that is agreed upon by both of you and that decision would be the decision of the court so the parties go back and they sit down and while sitting down they talk about the the needs of the orange so the parties realize that one neighbor needs the pulp of the orange because this particular neighbor is engaged in juice making activity okay this person wants to make orange juice and sell in the market whereas the other neighbor wants the peel of the orange so as to make skin care products and sell in the market so this way the two parties agree that one would have the pulp and the other would have the peels and the dispute was hence resolved and both parties then became amicable amicable neighbors now while one should not take this story very very seriously it still gives us a nice idea of what consensual dispute resolution really is right so uh, the forms of consensual the common forms of consensual dispute resolution mechanisms are mediation conciliation and negotiation now see there there can be no hard and fast rule on uh, the different forms of consensual dispute resolution mechanisms in fact these are things that cannot be defined either by law or in practice because you can always come up with different mechanisms of uh, consensually uh, resolving your disputes so please don't uh, resort to just this particular list in fact we should always keep our minds open and accept new forms of consensual dispute resolution mechanisms right so let's get into mediation so the elements of mediation are it is voluntary and it is dispute centered okay except in the case of court mandated uh, mediations but even in court mandated mediations there can be no uh, force forceful uh decision made on the parties the court can only mandate the parties to go into mediation but the court cannot uh, direct the parties to enter into a settlement agreement right 
and it is a confidential and structured process and uh, the mediator is usually a qualified individual who uses special skills of communication negotiation and other social skills to arrive at a mutually acceptable solutions for all parties um, the emphasis of mediation as opposed to an adversarial form of dispute resolution in courtroom based settings is that this really focuses and emphasizes on relationship building between the parties and uh, the objective of the mediation as i mentioned previously is not necessarily focused on who is right but rather what is right for parties there is no proof of innocence or proof of guilt and the parties must reach at an uh, at a binding settlement agreement on their own volition and finally parties must be willing out uh, willing to uh, crease uh, to iron out the creases in the relationship that is they must be willing to make little compromises they must be willing to uh, face certain facts and at the same time they must be willing to put certain things out in the uh, mediation platform right now broadly speaking there are three types of mediation but i mentioned uh, like i mentioned previously you cannot uh, you know we cannot restrict ourselves to believing that there are just three kinds of mediations in fact there can be many many kinds of mediation and uh, the most common style of mediation that is usually also a competition based uh mediation uh, in uh, you know across the world is the is the facilitative form of mediation in the facilitative form of mediation the the role of the mediator is to facilitate the process and to ensure that the parties arrive to a peaceful mutually agreed upon solution and uh, in this case the mediator must assume a rather passive position and not be very involved in determining the um, the details and the uh, and you know give creative solutions that is not the role of the mediator the role of the mediator is simply to sit and to ensure the process is uh, continuously uh, going ahead and there are no obstacles or hindrances throughout the course of the mediation and uh, in the evaluative form of mediation which is slightly different and you can say is almost opposite is where the mediator is also more active and more involved in the proceedings and the mediator or uh, is you know frequently presenting their own views into the merits of the case providing solutions and uh, you know directing uh, and steering the direction of the mediation in one particular way and sometimes there are problems between uh, problems between the parties in terms of communications and sometimes the parties reach an impasse so in this case the medi mediator is more active and uh, is actively working to break down the channels of communication so that the parties are always on the same page and even in cases of uh, uh, disputes within the mediation and the mediator must use their skills and their qualifications to ensure that the process goes on and then there is this transformative form of mediation and in the transformative form the so uh, the transformative form of mediation is basically where the mediator is active as well as passive and uh, active in the sense that it takes the lead in the mediation but it takes the lead by encouraging the parties to be more vocal to try and understand the strengths and objectives and aims of the parties to the mediation and uh, basically the relationship of the two parties must transform through the course of the mediation and at the end of the uh, session or the uh, collect collection of sessions the the relationship must be on a different level than what it started with and that is why we use the word transformative because we see a transformation in the nature of the relationship between the parties right now this brings us to the part where we must ask what makes a good mediator so a good mediator is someone who is trustworthy and when i talk about trustworthy i mean confidentiality okay because confidentiality is one of the basic foundational principles of uh, mediation and a mediation cannot be expected to be fruitful if the mediator itself who is the very backbone of the foundation is not doing their due diligence that's why a mediator a good mediator inspires trust and uh, with trust comes confidentiality and the parties must trust the mediator enough to open up and uh, face all the facts and issues of the problem and if the communication is not open and if the parties are not vocal and if the parties are not clear about what they want and there is no meeting of mind then the mediation process is just a waste of time 
Okay, so uh, trustworthiness and confidentiality is extremely important uh, for the parties and the mediator, right? So second is approachability. Mediators must be approachable. They must be friendly. They must be empathetic. And most importantly, they must be really good listeners. Okay, if a party in a dispute is opening up and uh, dwelling into the facts of the, from their perspective, then the mediator must be a real good listener and must not pass judgments or must not interrupt the parties because interruption would also sort of uh, in in many cases the parties could feel you know. Uh, that the mediator is hostile or the mediator is not collaborative or the mediator is not accommodative. So approachability is a must amongst, amongst good mediators. Uh, dedication. Uh, dedication is a quality that we expect in all great professionals and mediation uh, and mediators do not fall under the exception for this rule. So dedication is necessary and the role of the mediator we must understand is not just to sit there and listen to the facts like some sort of gram panchayat. That is not what we expect. Mediators must be dedicated. They must understand and they must work delicately in the situation. Right. And perceptiveness. Perceptiveness is extremely important in the mediator. While the mediator is not supposed to speak much in course of the mediation, but the mediator must understand very exactly what is going among the parties what the party means when a party says certain things and needs to understand all the uh, complexities of the arrangement or the transaction and you know they need to understand the issues and outline the underlying risks that are involved and at the same time the uh, mediator must also understand the position of the parties and what they are looking for and in sensitive matters also the mediator must sort of try to see what exactly is it that the parties seek to achieve at the end of this mediation? But at the same time, that does not mean that the mediator must be actively participating. No, the job of the mediator is not the same as that of a legal advisor. Okay. And finally, we come back, we come to this point of impartiality, which is neutrality. Mediator must be neutral. Uh, there should be no conflict of interest and there should be no uh, underlying hidden agendas and the mediator must be extremely impartial and the problem with impartiality comes in cases where say there is a case of a divorce where the parties have had a bad relationship and uh, they are not uh, on good terms at all and then sometimes the mediator can you know sort of give in to their own biases personal biases and uh, feel uh, empathy or sympathy towards one particular party, but they must remember that the job of the mediator is to set aside your emotions completely while dealing with the facts and while dealing with the law. There is no room for emotions in mediators uh, and the emotions must come only from the parties, if at all. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so this is negotiation, right? And negotiation is the most common way of dispute resolution in the entire world. And we have been negotiating to resolve our disputes with our friends, with our family members since we were little kids. And um, if, if it can be used as a common way of dispute resolution in um, different scenarios, it can also be used in complex business transactions. It can be used in uh, complex family matters or complex civil matters as well. Right. Uh, so basically, this is just any form of direct or indirect communications whereby parties have opposing interests and they discuss the form of any joint action which they might take to manage and ultimately resolve the disputes between them. Right? Negotiations uh, may be used to resolve an already existing problem. And like I mentioned, given the presence of negotiation in daily life, because we are negoci negotiating a lot more than we uh, belief in our everyday life and hence negotiation is also a good way of dispute resolution. And then these are the characteristics of a negotiation. Negotiations are voluntary and no, but no party can be forced into a negotiation and they can be either bilateral or multilateral depending on the need of the moment and the need of the dispute in question. And similar to mediation, they are non-adjudicative. The parties must consensually come to a decision, if at all, and no third party 
can direct the parties to uh, act in a certain manner or uh, settle in a certain way right negotiations are informal there is no prescribed rules or no prescribed uh, even uniforms or prescribed settings they can happen anywhere anytime at the convenience of the parties uh, negotiations uh, usually are confidential but if there is a risk of uh, a breach of confidentiality then parties can always use uh, other remedies available to them in law and in equity and at the same time negotiations are extremely flexible and the parties parties choose everything that governs a negotiation right now choosing the correct form of dispute resolution mechanism so now what something that i noticed in my uh, late college days and my years in practicing uh, law is that many young people have this great enthusiasm about alternative dispute resolution and they sort of propagate the idea that uh, courtrooms should be entirely replaced by alternative dispute resolution uh, processes and there is no need for litigation anymore but that is not correct in fact the real skill lies in identifying what is the correct form of dispute resolution and what would suit best to the dispute at hand or the parties involved in the matter okay that's why a uh, few uh, practitioners have coined this term appropriate dispute resolution where you must identify what is appropriate uh, what is the appropriate mechanism to resolve your dispute and we should not look at uh, even mediation and negotiation arbitration as an alternative to courtroom see the problem with alternative is that the standard norm is uh, courtroom dispute resolution and the alternative to that would be your uh, consensual based dispute resolution processes or arbitration now in fact we should look at all dispute resolution mechanisms we should keep them on the same pedestal and then we must carefully evaluate which method would suit best now for example if there is a family law dispute where the parties will need to have an ongoing relationship even after the uh, dispute is resolved then a mediation or a collaborative method they foster a uh, you know a, an expeditious uh, problem solving mentality rather than an adversarial one and uh, you know many many people can just view this familial familial uh, mediation session sort of like therapy but instead of the therapist talking you have the two parties coming and evaluating your options trying to understand and uh, in practice you see many problems being solved in uh, mediation because uh, through the course of the dispute there is no communication between the parties or communication is broken down but once the party sits inside a uh, mediation you know mediation chamber or any venue uh, that they decide upon then after talking you see that many cases just they solve themselves just by communicating right but at the same time this cannot be the case for every case and uh, you know in every dispute because sometimes the uh, relationship of the parties are really deteriorated and the trust has completely broken down in that case sometimes the parties in a dispute they just want to get done with it they want to say either uh, decide on the monetary aspect or the partition aspect of it and uh, in that case they would like to just end the session as soon as possible um, and in these cases i would say that uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms and mechanisms would not be appropriate right so here are a list of examples where cdr may be appropriate and that is if the party desire to resolve the dispute in a private forum you know when there are like problems between big business houses or individuals who are uh subject to public domain then in in these cases uh they would prefer a confidential uh, consensual based dispute resolution mechanism and in cases where parties you know they want to seek communication uh, for example in a in a big business house uh there is a large transaction between two parties and there is a small tax dispute so in this case the parties would not want to go to court and um you know ruin whatever relationship they have Uh, in order to preserve the larger transaction and look at the bigger picture so uh, mediation or a similar process would be in fact quite helpful in this because the parties can sit and they can just sort out the small minor issue and preserve the entire relationship between the two parties right and um cost is another factor in determining 
and time obviously time is of the essence uh, similarly there are some situations where cdr may not be appropriate and that is in cases where a legal precedent or a former public judicial pronouncement on issues is required in cases relating to say uh, defamation where the parties must prove their reputation and in cases uh, where there is uh, allegations of fraud bad bad faith harassment or other credibility issues and uh, again history of violence when two parties cannot sit in the same room and speak comfortably as i mentioned communication is key to any mediation and when parties are unable to sit and communicate then the entire process becomes futile right so in nepal uh, mediation act 2011 is the key legislation governing mediation and the legislation permits for mediation as a method to resolve the disputes uh, the act mandates that once settlement is arrived between both parties and it is executed then such settlement is binding to the parties there is very limited scope of appeal and uh, in many cases there are court mandated mediations as well um, i have also uh, taken part in many court mandated mediations but uh, the way they are conducted in nepal the, they are not fruitful in most cases now what is the future of alternative dispute resolution and many of us may know about multi tiered dispute resolution clauses which is although uh, more about the present than the future but in the future we see a universal application of multi tiered dispute resolution um, clauses in this what happens that, is that in an agreement the parties enter into steps uh that would be taken by them in events of dispute and it could start with something like say uh it would start with an amicable negotiation between parties and then if ne negotiation fails and parties would go for a mediation and if mediation fails then the parties would resort to arbitration so in this case you know the, because uh immediately going to litigation could be problematic for parties due to many factors as discussed before you know time you have time constraints and then there are costs involved and then there is about publicity and all of these things that's why the clauses they state step by step procedure that the parties will have to follow in order to resolve a dispute and these uh, steps are also independent of each other and only when one fails then you would proceed to the second and if all the phases are failed then only the parties would you know resort to courts or arbitration right and then especially given the pandemic uh, last year we saw a huge rise in online dispute resolution which we also refer to as odr so this this method of dispute resolution this branch they use they use technology to facilitate the resolution of disputes and it in fact it has been seen as the equivalent of an online adr that's why the name odr and uh, you know and we see the major application of odr in uh, disputes arising out of b2c online transactions where there's a, now you see there are many many transactions that take uh, that are hosted by the cloud and uh, as time passes we see more and more cross border uh, transactions and trade and obviously you know the number of disputes would only ever keep increasing and number of dispute, disputes would never decrease so in these cases in order to facilitate parties uh, that are located very remotely from each other odr is a great technique to re resolve disputes without having to actually you know spend a lot of time invest in a lot of time to be in the particular place right so the different methods of odr are uh, consensual uh, dispute resolution which is uh, automated negotiation where there are you know there are online biddings and online settlement of uh, bidding disputes then there is assisted negotiation where uh, assisted negotiation is something like a mediation but artificial intelligence would take place of uh, the mediator so to all the young aspiring lawyers and the young practicing lawyers here i have some bad news for you machines are going to take your job soon so be prepared for that and then we have online arbitration which is the same process just conducted uh, remotely uh, over the internet and this saves people from a lot of time and costs right now what is the path forward and how do we ensure that 
alternative dispute resolution eventually reaches the goal of appropriate dispute resolution so in this i believe that the need for the hour is a uniform statute which resolves uh, which you know which governs resolving disputes and uh, these statutes should make it mandatory for parties uh, who have certain nature of disputes to first enter into a cdr form of dispute resolution before resorting to courtroom litigation and uh, the uk actually practices a form of this where certain disputes must be um, you know deliberated upon by the parties to dispute pre trial so i think the introduction of this in our part of the world in the south asian subcontinent could actually help also the court um, ease their burden and uh, we also need to have more mediation focus institutions with trained professionals even today we have uh, people who sort of are not just very few people are just specific uh, specifically specializing in mediation and we know many people who are uh, you know uh, also courtroom practitioners who also do mediation who also do arbitration so i think a little bifurcation between uh rules of these individuals would uh, help in advocating um uh, you know uh, more approachability of these uh, consensual based dispute resolutions which brings me to my final point which is the requirement of public awareness and you know these webinars and legal discourses and when we have qualified mediators practicing mediators coming and engaging with people and even law schools having specialized courses on these matters could uh see us in the next 10 years adopt uh, appropriate dispute resolution way of uh, you know having our disputes resolved so with this uh, i come to the end of my presentation and uh, i will now be entertaining any questions or comments or feel free to just participate Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, in, uh, exemplary presentation and giving us insightful views of all the arbitrations and uh, alternative dispute resolutions, types of mediations, and everything. We hope that this was a very insightful presentation for all for all of the audiences. And we have a few questions from our audience side, which was uh, noted down in the chat box. So, first question we have uh, is. But uh, are there uh, there aren't a lot of arbitrations also in public, like at least a lot of big companies. So uh, is that uh, just media attention or is it something that parties choose? Okay, so uh, to understand this question, we first need to understand the nature of uh, incorporation of the entities. Now, when you have even big companies, which are private companies, then these companies have the option to... keep all the matters private to keep their arbitral awards private and ensure that uh, everything that happens inside the arbitration venue is uh, confidential but in cases of public uh, companies public limited companies then these things cannot be controlled right because uh, there are different sort of compliance requirements and different disclosure requirements and uh, when you have a public company where the and even in cases of listed companies where anybody can be a shareholder even i can go buy buy a few shares of the company and be a shareholder and that would entitle me to know about the disputes that my company is going through so in case of public companies these disputes have to be made uh, public but in case of private companies no matter the no matter how big their sizes are uh, you can still choose to preserve the confidentiality of the proceedings i hope that answers your question Thank you so much for answering the question and clearing out the doubts. Now we have another question from the audience side, which is, what are the career aspects of mediation in Nepal as well as around the world? This is like a question from my side also. So could you? Okay. You have the floor. Okay. So like I mentioned while discussing the uh, last slide, in Nepal there is no strict separation between a courtroom advocate and a mediator. and we see the duality of uh, these individuals who are engaged in both these professions and uh, see the problem with uh, the people in nepal is that uh, even though we are not generally adversarial in nature there is a lot of disputes that are taken directly to the court because people are completely unaware and as you know that even the reputation of lawyers in the country is really bad you know they seem to Uh, view the lawyers as frauds and people who are just out to cheat them 
So for this, we need major, major sensitization in the public. We want uh, the public to understand that, you know, it's just like, uh, say, sitting in a restaurant and just talking your issues and sorting it out, as we say, colloquially. So if the people can understand that, then maybe in the next 10, 15 years, we can see a rise uh, in scope. But as of today, uh, to be completely honest, the scope of being a full time mediation practitioner in Nepal is uh, very low. But the same cannot be said for the world. Uh, in different countries, there are, you know, like, for example, even in India, you have uh, mediation cells in all high courts. And uh, if you go to places like Singapore, then there are special, uh, you know, the, the, the mediation convention was signed in Singapore in 2018. And now there are institutions like SIMI, which is uh, the mediation equivalent of their arbitration center. So uh, in the world, obviously, there are many uh, scopes and many avenues for mediators to take but unfortunately in nepal that's not the case thank you so much for it, uh, sir for clearing the question and also answering it really takes like 10 to 15 years to change the uh, the perception so the third question we have is if there is an impasse between the parties how can we break that okay so as the mediator um you need to be very uh, ready to uh, know, I mean, just make peace with the fact that there is going to be an impasse in many cases. And uh, the most important thing is that, you know, uh, something that people need to understand is that while we say that mediation is a speedy process, that does not necessarily mean that uh, the mediation must be completed in a matter of one week or two weeks. You know, you can take a couple of months to solve the problem. And that will still be much faster compared to other forms of dispute resolution. And in many impasses, many cases of impasse, time and communication would uh, heal it. But, uh, you know, in that case, the mediator needs to perceptive, needs to understand whether, okay, is there some way where I can, you know, sort of create a middle ground where both parties can compromise on a little bit or sometimes it's just a question of ego where immediately after one party apologizes, the impasse is resolved. Uh, you know, so in this way, uh, the, the mediator needs to be aware, the mediator needs to be active and uh, and sometimes if required, mediator needs to deal with both parties separately, you know, in separate sessions and try to understand what is it that each party wants and then underline the common uh, the common objectives of the parties. And you can start with that and see uh, another way to solve this is you when you have a huge issue at hand then you can just break it down into smaller issues and you can resolve those issues one by one, which would in turn lead to the resolving of the entire issue. You need not go jump into the entire thing and be like, I'm going to take a huge bite of this and I'm going to solve this because I'm a great and cool mediator. No, so that is not the approach you need to take. And uh, for a mediator, it is very important to have incredible flexibility and you must be very oriented on what exactly that you are here for. You are here to ensure that this dispute, uh, you know, I will do my best to ensure that this dispute gets resolved and uh, and you need to evaluate what exactly you can do here. You need to take this on a case to case basis. But at the end of the day, some disputes just don't get resolved and parties, uh, they try their best and the impasse, uh, both parties are, you know, really stringent on not compromising. And in that case, you can't really do much. Uh, okay, so the next question we have is how can we understand that mediator will not be influenced by the other party? Okay, so this is from the perspective of the parties to the dispute as opposed to the perspective of the mediator. Yeah, well, I mean, that is up to the mediator to convince you. And uh, I mean, I get the question because, you know, this is uh, a new form of dispute resolution in this part of the world. So, you know, you can always sort of uh, you, you will always have some doubts while going into it. But at the same time, I mean, if the mediator cannot convince you that they are neutral, then the, the process cannot go on because this process is built up on trust. And if you feel that way, then uh, either you could have like a, a direct session with the mediator where you could tell the mediator you feel this way. And if you don't want to do that, then you can always appoint another mediator. And yeah, these are the options available to you. But I mean, the onus is more on the mediator to prove that they are neutral because any party would be, 
you know especially if it is a sensitive matter or if it is a case concerning large amounts of monetary sums then yeah a little suspicion is natural uh so the another question we got from the audience side was how a lawyer should prepare for mediation um okay so for the lawyer uh you need to understand that despite what mediation is all about despite mediation being about you know a, a, a process of fostering relationships and a process of resolving disputes by you know being friendly and looking forward to future relationships your obligation and your responsibility is simply toward your client and your job is only to protect your client and you need not worry about creating relationships and all those things and i mean if the client does not want you to be friends with them then you need not be friends with them you just your interest lies in protecting the client and getting for the client as much as you can so uh, i think the uh, role of the lawyer in this different uh, across different forms of dispute resolution would not change significantly you just have to make certain adjustments uh, given the process change in processes but at the same time you must focus on protecting the best interests of your client thank you so much for for addressing this question that was raised by the audiences so uh, that looks like we have all the questions that we uh, have addressed and on behalf of myself and all the participants today we just want to thank you so much for such a vibrant interactive and knowledgeable session i'm sure we all got to know and learn something a more amazing things today and the entire team of mediate guru is really thankful that you agreed to become a part of this session uh, looking forward to have more and more sessions with you sir also thank you to all the participants for joining us today and i would request everyone to fill up the feedback form before you leave in order to receive your certificates if you don't want to miss any updates from mediate guru follow us on our social media handles and for more information don't forget to visit our website www.mediateguru.com stay healthy and stay safe everyone we will see you super soon thank you all thank you all for joining us thank you sir thank you thank you mediate guru